It's now my distinct honor and privilege to introduce today's luncheon keynote. Dr. George Freeman is founder and chairman of Geopolitical Futures, which is dedicated to forecasting the course of the international system and internationally recognized strategist in global affairs and a New York Times best-selling author. His most recent book, The Storm Before the Calm, America's Discord, The Coming Crisis of the 2020s and the Triumph Beyond, focuses on the United States, predicting how the 2020s will bring dramatic upheaval and reshaping of American government, foreign policy, economics, and culture. His other best-selling books include Next 100 Years, a forecast for the 21st century, Flashpoints, the Emerging Crisis in Europe, The Next Decade, America's Secret War, The Future of War, and The Intelligence Edge. He's a prominent mentor and leader. James Horn Fisher published his books, just had uh, Eric Wertheim, one of his former students, come up and introduce himself again and reintroduce himself. Um, he's been a member of this of this history family for a long time, and we're very pleased that he's agreed to make his first appearance here at a Naval Institute event. So ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome to the stage Mr. George Friedman. Hello. When I wrote my, one of my first books, The Future of War, I discovered uh, the Naval Institute. I plagiarized everything I could. <laughs> I will continue this tradition, <laughs> claiming mine as yours. In dealing with geopolitics, the essential thing you must have is perspective. When I was young, the Soviet Union was about to overwhelm the United States. Now, I hear China's about to overwhelm the United States or the United States is going to go to Vietnam and teach them a lesson or two. We've lived, we live as Americans, manic depressive lives, particularly when it comes to politics. It is either all lost or an easy slam dunk. Geopolitics is neither. It is a complex process of protecting your interests, understanding what your interests are, taking your enemy seriously, but not so seriously that you're paralyzed into voiding your own interests. So in that context, I'm going to speak about enemies, Russia and China. Not really enemies, but sort of enemies. Not nuclear enemies, not yet. But I want to try to explain what it is that shouldn't concern us about these countries. So let me begin with the question of an alliance between Russia and China. It has been brooded about that these two countries will get together, and as a result, we'll all be speaking Russian and Chinese in San Francisco. It's more complicated than that. Let's think about the problems of alliance. Firstly, geographic distance. It's a long way from Russia's wars in the Ukraine and China's battles in the Pacific, it is very hard to imagine how they work together. Where do they collaborate? Where does it come together? Second, they have a really bad history with each other. You'll remember the Battle of the Usuri River. No one else does, so you might. It was a time when the Russians and the Chinese slugged it out for an extended period of time, but a lot of casualties. It opened the door for Henry Kissinger to show up in Beijing and said, why don't we dance? And dance we did. And the alliance that opened up was not between Russia and China, communist countries, but temporarily with China and the United States. The United States had listening posts out in, Lop, out in uh, Zhejiang listening to the Russians. I'm not sure we trusted anything that came in on it, but it was fun being out there. But China entered not into an alliance with Russia, but with the United States. Why? Because there is a deep 
deep distrust by these two countries of each other. All through the 20th century, they fought wars. Russia constantly invaded China, usually at the worst possible time. And they didn't uh, really like each other. So when we talk about an alliance, we have to first think about geography. An alliance is not a piece of paper. It is a working military organization, like the US and Britain in World War II. There was military forces working together to achieve an end. The Russians and the Chinese do not have the ability to form such a united front. There's historical tension. They don't really trust each other. Well, I didn't really trust the Brits, but what the hell, they're ours. <laughs> Um, but this has to be understood that the idea of an alliance between the two countries has to have a geographical logic and it has to have some sort of trust. Without that, it is simply the New York Times writing editorials. So let's talk about each of these countries a bit. Okay. Why did Russia invade Ukraine? I should say that I wrote a book, The Next 100 Years, that said that Russia would invade Ukraine in the year 2020, about. Now, mind you, I will tell you only my successes, none of my failures, so. <laughs> it, if it appears that I'm a genius, I'm working hard on it. <laughs> Russia? lives and dies by strategic depth. It survived Napoleon because an attack into Russia starts in the winter, in the summer, I should say. That's when you get your troops mobilized. And then you move toward Moscow. And by the time you get to Moscow, you freeze. Exactly the same thing happened to Hitler. He launched in, Jan in June. By the time he got to Moscow, having seemingly conquered the country, he was defeated by the weather. For Russia, this is the foundation of everything. In the same way, that the foundation of, of national security for the United States is controlling the two oceans, naval power. This is their fundamental. Now, the problem was this. After the fall of the Soviet Union, which they blamed on us, after the fall of the Soviet Union, Ukraine was independent. The distance between the northern border of Ukraine and Moscow was 260 miles by road tree. If we take the side road, it's a little longer. The point is that Russia faced, from the beginning of the fall of the Soviet Union, a catastrophic situation. Now, you and I know that the Americans could always be trusted. But the Russians have a somewhat different view. <laughs> And it was desperate that they move the border west. Now, they couldn't do it fast. They didn't build a military fast enough. They needed a lot more chaos going on. And they waited for this moment. And they struck. Now, why did the United States have to get involved? Because if Ukraine fell, the Russians would be once again on the border of NATO. And those of us who spent some time at the Fulda Gap will remember that that wasn't a really heartwarming period of our lives. In other words, the United States could not give the Russians what they needed, and the Russians could not give the Americans what they needed, and so that's when wars begin. It does not begin because Putin is salivating crazily, he may well be, but that's not where they begin. It certainly doesn't begin because Biden is stupid. He may be, but that's not why the war begins. We can make all these claims about politicians leading us in the war, but it was hardwired. It was hardwired that Russia at some point had to go into Ukraine. It was hardwired that the United States would have to resist. The American strategy, the Russian strategy was to send forces in. The American strategy was to have native forces, as we used to call it, Ukrainians, 
armed to the teeth with American weapons, we stand back, take nobody coming in at Dover Air Force Base, thank God. Ukrainians fight for their country, and we make sure they don't lose. The critical strategy of the United States is not winning. It's preventing a loss. Because if there is preventing a loss at a certain point, the Russians will raise questions about their leadership. Also, they'll raise questions about being drafted. They started out with a small military because of a massive intelligence failure on their part. First, they completely miscalculated the Ukrainians. The Ukrainians really hate the Russians. Somebody in FSB missed that. Two, they miscalculated the Germans. They thought the Germans would stick with them because they needed oil, but a trip was brought to the United States by the chancellor, and he said, oh, I forgot, I have four in the United States, excuse me, yes. And thirdly, he completely misunderstood. FSB completely misunderstood the United States. It saw that they were, we were bad-mouthing either, each other, that we were enraged at everything, that we believed in the, ble the deep slay state and everything else. They f didn't remember what the KGB, old KGB knew. This is the way we always are. We're always pissed off at somebody else. He genuinely thought this was the moment because of what he thought was instability in the United States, not just healthy exercise. And as a result, he attacked from a stupid formation. Three armored columns, hundreds of miles apart, rushing down to envelop something that isn't there. There is no center of gravity to the Ukrainian army. <coughs> Plus, those of you who ever were in Germany and ever had the pleasure of watching a Russian exercise, logistics is their biggest problem. They cannot manage moving forward at a rapid pace and keeping the fuel going too. And that's what happened to them. The Cypher's of anti tank missiles that work pretty well. So we are now in a war which does not in any way involve China. In fact, the Chinese abstained when the UN voted on condemning Russia. Now that's a big deal because your allies are f forever, like a marriage, you don't abstain. You go vote right. They didn't. This was your basic screw you to Russia, if there needed to be one. So now Russia is sitting there. What do you do in this situation? You declare that you're insane because ever you get into a bar fight, Pretend to be insane. <laughs> okay? And he's been to bar fights, and he is. I'm going to nuke you. I'm going to use dirty nukes in you. I'm going to nuke your mother. I'm everybody that I can nuke. He's not an idiot. He knows that he's going to turn into radioactive dust personally if he does this. He knows that's not an option. Why does he do it? Here's where we get perspective, we have to stay calm. You have to say, he's doing it because his back's against the wall and he's got to do something. Be calm, which is not what we're good at, but this is what's going on there. Okay, so Russia had a major intelligence failure, inappropriate weapons, and didn't send enough force. His final problem is that he's had to dragoon, I won't call, that subscription, dragoon an army. He's out of an army. The one problem that he has is training an army. It's one thing happening in your, in your camp. How do you train the infantrymen? I think it would take about six months before somebody goes through AIT the Russians are going to send completely untrained troops into combat. Well, no, they're not, but they've done this because they had to. The basic weakness of 
the Russian army is a lack of sergeants. What I mean by this is the Chinese have sergeants. The British, God knows, has sergeants. Scary. The Americans, I can tell you a story about Fort Bragg, but it wasn't pretty. <laughs> we train, we have trainers. We have experienced forces who have been in combat, hopefully, but even if they haven't, they understand the basic principles of tactical warfare. And for six, well, three months, it's pounded into their heads till they never want to think of that day again. The Russians do not have sergeants. They have lieutenants who have been in six months who are assigned to train people who have been there no months. This is why the Russian army performs badly. It has never had a coherent training program. Why? Because in World War II, they didn't have the time for it. And because they didn't have the time for it, they sent them in to die. And it was not kidding. The best they could do to hold the Russians, to hold the Germans, I should say, was hit them, hit them again, hit them again, and take the casualties. But this is a nuanced war, a complex war, choreographed by the Americans. I won't say that the Pentagon has a lot to do with planning, but what the hell. This is planned for it. It's with a force that's highly motivated, totally committed, and knows that it has the United States at its back, and the British at its back. Even the Germans at its back, but they you don't trust. Okay, so. This is the problem with the German. It's not clear how the Russians can win. Russia has to have a peace treaty because its option is nuclear war or a peace settlement. It cannot win. Its forces are not in a position to win. They can take them in. They can spend all winter training them. And that may have some effect, but basically they have an untrained force fighting a highly motivated force backed up by the superb technologies that are available today. So this is the Russian situation. The Russians have a ground problem. It's a battle problem of the infantry. The Chinese problem is a naval problem. Yes, I know they go all the way back to Tibet and everything. Their problem is a naval problem. They are boxed in by the South China Sea. But there's a different problem, which is China has had a massive economic downturn. And everybody's waiting for it to improve. But it won't. And this is the critical thing about China. The United States was China in 1900. We had the Civil War. It was a disaster. We got low wages. We exported like crazy. And by the time of 1900, we exported, we produced one half of all the industrial goods in the world. And everybody said, they're going to take over the world. To which the answer was, not yet. Because what happened was Europe had one of its wars. They came out of it unable to consume our products. They couldn't take the exports that we had, that they had land for. The United States had a financial crisis that turned into the Great Depression in 1929. Japan was in a very similar situation. Hiroshima, Nagasaki had not done any good to its morale. It was a disaster. And what happened was the Korean War. The United States during the Korean War had to get hold of tank, uh, trucks, maybe 100, 200. Because sending back to Detroit would be ridiculous. So I went to a little company in Japan says, can you build a tank? They said, oh, so, no problem, build a tank. The name of the company was Toyota. 
And that was how Toyota began. And the next thing Toyota did was swamp the American market with inexpensive cars undercutting the American market. And Japan soared with all these exports coming into hungry markets. And Japan looked like we were all going to be speaking Japanese, standing around holding hands and having quality corners and everything like that. Movies were made about how Japan was taking us over. And then what happened was that Japan ran out of customers. A lot of customers, like the Americans, said, cut it out. You're killing our auto industry. We're not buying anymore. Other countries pushed back in this way, that way. And what happened to Japan in 1991? It collapsed. Its economy, economy collapsed. Now, the United States is crazy, but it holds together. The Japanese are crazy and never go apart. Now we get to China. China had one of the most extraordinary economic explosions in history on the order of the American and the Japanese. So we've seen this before. And this is the basic problem of export-oriented economies. You can say, wow, they've taken over our country and everything else. No, what's going to happen is they run out of room to grow. Companies, countries like the United States block their exports. They go down. So what Japan happened to Japan a couple of years ago, it went into the nosedive. I'm sorry, China went into a nosedive. It went into an economic nosedive that it can't recover from because its economy is based on powerful exports and Western investment in its businesses. And that's not going to happen again because the rest of the world is also in recession or about to be, whatever, whatever Biden decides we are. Uh, you know, we're in this economic problem. We cannot float the Chinese. And therefore, the Chinese are in deep trouble. Their problem is domestic. Their problem is that there are vast parts of China that never experienced growth. If you go to Shanghai and you drive 30 miles west of the city, you see poverty like you've never seen before. The coastal region that trades with the rest of the world does fine. The rest of the country really doesn't. And so we can say, because I'm an expert in this field, that Chinese people are really upset with poverty. OK? I, I studied this. And so what you have is a political crisis emerging. And in that political crisis emerging, the former president gets led out of the building by horse. Why? Because he was a successful president, not because he personally, it was just as he got the right time. Xi can't admit that he's hosed, so he has to find somebody else. Poor who is let out of the room, and we won't see him again for a while, maybe. So what you have is China in tremendous trouble. Now the question comes up, will they invade Taiwan? What do they want with Taiwan? What problem will holding Taiwan solve? What, is, what does that do for you? It makes you feel good for a couple of days. But then everybody's out there. Plus, how do you invade Taiwan? Taiwan is an amphibious operation. And here I am at the Naval Institute, so I will not tell you how hard it is to conduct amphibious operations over a distance that takes you at least nine hours to reach in mass force Taiwan. And how many ways US satellites can pick up the movement and how many ways can submarines, missiles, whatever you want, think about it. What is China's fundamental fear, the one they never express? That we will mine their harbors. If the United States mines their harbors, China is an exporting power, an importing power. We can block 
China, over you know, all sorts of reasons. I once said this to a senior Chinese officer, and he said, but you can't use submarines in the South China Sea. What do I know? <laughs> so, oh, okay, what do you think we will use? How about aircraft dropping mines? How's that work for you? <laughs> the point is that the Chinese are not a superpower. They are backed up by geography, by a string of islands that allow us to interdict constantly. We have a line of allies from Japan, South Korea, Taiwan for sure, Philippines, Indonesia, if it's Saturday, you know, <laughs> give me a chance. Indonesia, Straits of Malacca, we have the Australians with us, we have the Japanese actually building ships, we should be really careful with this. <laughs> the, the balance of power is so overwhelmingly against China at sea. They can, if they want, invade Pakistan, and they're welcome to it. <laughs> <laughs> but coming at us, coming at the U.S. Navy deployed just to, a little to the east of the line is not possible. So when we look at the situation clearly, when we take a look at what is the situation that we're looking at, one, the Russians are in desperate trouble, and so long as we hold our ground, we don't take casualties, and the Russians are going to have to sue for peace. Putin will wind up in day camp or something. The Chinese are incapable of taking Taiwan, and if they took it, so what? All those who care about Taiwan, please raise your hands. Yes, you would get a sense of loss, a sense of, you know, are we capable of defending? And that matters. But in geopolitics, we're kind of ruthless in our thinking. The Chinese aren't going to do that because they don't get much out of it, and they could fail. And the one thing the Chinese can't afford is screwing up an assault on Taiwan. They can't do, people have said, what did the Chinese learn from the Russians in Ukraine? Don't screw up. Very important lesson. Are you sure you can take the U.S. fleet? Well, I, I think I can. That's not good enough. So we're in a situation where a Russian-Chinese alignment is impossible. It's just geographically impossible, historically impossible. Secondly, we have seen Russia do something that it absolutely had to do and is in the process of failure. And we see the cost there is. In the Pacific, we see China focusing on a non-critical solution. Take the Philippines. That's a serious solution. Taiwan can be surrounded. Taiwan can be overcome. Taiwan maybe is the best place to do where you waste the Chinese military. A lot of different ways. But what the Chinese have learned is don't mess with the Americans. Now, I got criticized by my readers for being pro-American. <laughs> Yuck, okay. Uh, but the point is, what has emerged from this is the enormous power of the United States. Unorthodox power. It is not the power the Russians expected to see. It is not the Americans standing back and waiting to surge into Ukraine. It is building a structure that doesn't require it. In other words, we look pretty smart. Not that often, but here we go. In China, they keep saying they're going to have a nuclear war. Do they understand that they will be personally 
nuclear dust 30 minutes afterwards? Yes, they do, which is why they don't do it. As I said about Iran once, the best thing to have is a nuclear program. The worst thing to have is a nuclear weapon. This was about Israel. Okay? Israel can live with a nuclear program. <laughs> nuclear weapon, it's going to hit. And the same thing with what we're seeing here. So what is emerging from this, counter to what you will hear, I think, from most other people, is the tremendous power of the United States. A very idiosyncratic power, but one that decided the fate of Central Asia, Central Asia of Ukraine, is deciding the fate of the, of the Pacific, of China, and is doing so with extraordinary fewer casualties than any other activity. This is what we have to grasp, but this is why I started with a sense of perspective. We Americans constantly think our leaders are idiots. They may be, but, <laughs> but we aren't all. The Republic consists of people who have a great deal of knowledge of what has to be done, and it gets done. So we won all our wars except Vietnam, when we just let the military run it. <laughs> and we have done brilliantly here, and we do not recognize what, was, what has happened. What has happened is this massive change in the perspective of the world of the United States. I'm not even talking about the economic assault on Russia, the things we've done to China so they can't get chips. So I'm not even talking about those things. It is that we do not have a sense of how successful we are at geopolitics. Partly because of our geography, partly because of our tactics, our technology, and so on. But far from a terrifying alliance of Russia and China, something emerging, each of them are struggling to find their balance against the United States. On the whole, I'm pleased with that outcome. It beats with having a bunch of grandchildren with having them preparing for a war. But the other guy did it. Thank you. Uh, moderate the questions from the audience and from our okay. online audience. I thought you were coming to beat me up or something. <laughs> um, well, Dr. Friedman, thank you for your remarks, and uh, we look forward to the audience Q&A. Uh, just as we did this morning, we have microphones <coughs> down front in the auditorium. Uh, please come down and state your name and ask a question. And for online audience, uh, please submit your questions through the, uh, the online portal. Um, the first question I want to take from, uh, from our online audience is uh, regarding what China would gain from absorbing Taiwan. You touched on this a little bit. Mm -hmm. Would it be a huge advantage to secure Taiwan semiconductors and thus the source of computer trip chips that are so essential to so many civilian and military assets in the world today? Well, as we retreated, I would assume that one of the last things we did is blow the hell out of those assets. Is um, a lot of assessments of, of, of Russia is that it's in decline. Um, there are some people think that China's in decline already and others that don't see that. Um, they think that we in the West are in decline. And so I was just wondering, um, but when we look at what's going on inside those countries, um, they seem to have uh, their own kinds of, uh, particular kinds of re resilience to collapsing internally, despite all the problems. And they, they assessed that we had those problems and that we wouldn't be able to overcome it to deal with, with Ukraine and perhaps with China. So I'm just wondering if you could uh, offer some comments about uh, the mirror imaging that's involved or just the, 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 the lack of, of, uh, of visibility or appreciation for different types of uh, decline and resilience in democratic and autocratic states. So since the founding of the United States, every 50 years, with Andrew Jackson, and John Adams, uh, Rutherford B. Hayes, Roosevelt, and so on, the United States goes through a decade of agony. 
which we entered into. But I will recall the 1970s where I went into a bar in Boone, North Carolina. I was told, get out of here, you hippie degenerate punk. I didn't even know when you knew all those words. So the anger that was there in the 70s, the counterculture, the fact that the uh, 82nd Airborne was called into uh, Detroit to put down the risings, the demonstrations at the Democratic a convention where the police and the demonstrators fought for days. It was very easy to say, and people did say it, that the United States was unable to recover. When we go back to 1929 and we see Huey Long, we see the collapse of our economy, we see people in the streets starving. Reasonable people said, we're, we're finished. And this is why I said sense of proportion. Know how each nation works. We Americans operate on a cycle where every 50 years we have a fundamental shift that has us go through a crisis that seems to be impossible to solve. And out of that last crisis came Ronald Reagan and the microchip revolution that we're still seeing. And out of the crisis of 1929 came the automobile as the center of our economy. Before that, it was electricity suddenly coming and lighting up our cities so that the cities could function at night. Technology is there, but also a sense of limitation of our age. We go this far and no farther. And you really have to live through the 70s to see how weird and bad it could get. And so now we are in our crisis. And I do believe that one of the reasons that Putin chose this time to attack is that he saw this attack and he understood this was our moment. It was because Putin had no understanding of Russia, of the United States whatsoever. Nor do the Germans or the French or the Japanese. The Japanese are still trying to recover from that lack of understanding. The point is we do this all the time. And then we go for a 40 year period of peace. I wrote a book on this. And that book basically says, the worse we feel now, the better it will be. And I go back all the way to John Quincy Adams, who did steal the, the election from Andrew Jackson. He actually, this one was real. He stole the election. And Jackson bided his time for four years, took over, and then ruined the bank that were holding the settlers back because they wouldn't lend the money. It was really interesting to see the orderliness of the American the American history and also see in perspective what we're experiencing now. Because one of the things I know we saw in 70 is this was the amendment of America. We could not possibly survive what's going on now. Here I am. Yeah, for the midshipmen in the audience, Dr. Friedman didn't even mention disco music for the 1970s, so <laughs> it was really bad. Uh, over here to Lieutenant Craig. Thank you, sir. Uh, good afternoon, Lieutenant Kyle Craig, Service Warfare Officer. Uh, I wanted to ask your opinion about the role of the Arctic, o Arctic Ocean as a potential future fissure between Russia and China if it's no longer a barrier for the Russians, but a maritime corridor that the Chinese are potentially transiting as a way in which that now encroaches upon critical Russian territory. Well, Thank now, you. I know absolutely everything in the world, but I don't know that answer. <laughs> the problem I have with this whole Arctic business is okay, you crossed the Arctic. You now landed in northern Canada or northern Siberia. This is not going to get you anywhere fast. The types of things you can gain from an assault across the sea is limited. The use of that as a transport facility compared to, say, the Atlantic or the Pacific is unclear to me. I may be missing something. I certainly am missing a lot of companies that are getting contracts for things. 
but I don't I personally understand why this is a strategic <laughs> issue. But with everybody getting involved in it, you know, I can miss things, you know, happens. To the midshipman at the mic. Good afternoon, sir. Midshipman second class Will Rolfsted, 22nd Company. Um, a couple weeks ago, I asked a question to University of Hong Kong professor, whose name I forgot and forgot to write down, but... Uh, Chow. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, after his talk and after hearing you speak and a couple of other things that I've heard throughout the morning and, and through what I've read independently, I'm noticing the following trends in China. We've got internal divides, an aging population, large number of males uh, pro proportionate to females, a suppression state, ethnic tensions, economic issues, so on and so forth. Um, China has a history of its leadership losing legitimacy as part of the, the concept of the mandate of heaven. Um, all of these demonstrate, and especially looking back at the two times where China's been bankrupt, most recently 2001, when the WTO allowed them to join, pulling them out of that. Um, I see a country that, that looks far closer to revolution or civil war than any sort of international imperialistic ambitions. What are your takes on that? You're a midshipman. You don't need want to be in the Navy. You want to come with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. The number of stresses on China are enormous. And one of the things you see is that the government itself is unstable. We saw that before, around a month ago, when Xi and the Politburo said something, and two members of the Politburo left the meeting and wrote articles condemning it. In the United States, this would be no big thing. In China, it's huge. We see all sorts of evidence, aside from the fact that they took the former president out for a walk. Um, uh, we are seeing the outward signs of tension. Therefore, the perspective the US has about China and the perspective the Chinese have of themselves are very different. Now, we see ourselves as in dire trouble. They see themselves in dire trouble. So I could say that, well, it's just the way we both are. But you're absolutely right. The number of countervailing forces that are in play in China, not to mention Xinjiang, um, not to mention the fact that the Mo Inner Mongolians are not very happy. All these things. It really points is not to a revolution, at least to an inability of China to take great risks. When you have that sort of internal problem for the Chinese, you don't take risks. And there is exactly the place to look. And my wife will give you our card and number and everything. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Over here. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, my name is Ensign Nick Romano. I'm a cryptological warfare officer. Um, in your remarks, you mentioned that China it would be incapable of taking Taiwan largely because of the constellation of allies that encircle it in the West Pacific. What makes you confident that this coalition would stick together when the shooting starts and have a impact on the outcome of conflict? Well, I'm a silly man. I'm counting not on our allies but in the U.S. Navy. And the U.S. Navy receiving satellite signals as to the movement from the Western Front. And remember, if you do an amphibious assault, you want to land your, all your forces at the same time so you can get a beachhead and not be picked up apart, right? So you're going to see six, seven, eight different amphibious craft leaving Chinese waters and heading toward the Taiwanese Sea altogether. This is called a target-rich environment. So get to work, <laughs> get, your, get your sightings, pick out your weapons. That's what I'm counting on. I'm not counting on our allies doing anything but holding a very, very serious meeting. We will have that. But it will be the US Navy who will undoubtedly have plenty of intelligence warning. You don't mount up an invasion fleet without being noticed. And they will be in a position at the right time to start attriting the enemy. You don't have to sink all of them, just attrit them. So 
the answer is we don't count on them. I'm counting on you. Enjoy it. <laughs> a follow-on to that question comes from an online uh, uh, question. In theory, the U.S. Navy would defeat an attack on Taiwan, but what about the concern that U.S. Armed Forces capital stock, our weapon stock, is outdated, outdated and expensive to maintain, and advanced weapons are years from delivery? and uh, also recruiting is failing to meet its goals for the U.S. military right now. Thoughts on those? Those are all problems. Those are all serious problems. On the other hand, the United States is noted for its ability in the event of war to speed up acquisitions, speed up training, uh, motivate people to join in, sometimes like drafting them, <laughs> one definite thing. In other words, they are real problems. They are soluble, soluble problems. The most important thing is that the military have a plan in mind of what sort of weapons they want. My concern is that it is not clear to me that the U.S. Armed Forces have a clear idea of how they're going to fight this war. And one of the reasons we have those delays is that you know, our plans are the best intended and everything else, but there's disagreement that I'm not always sure the senior command, pardon me, everybody here? Uh, altogether is following the debates down several layers below. So I think it's time that we all got together and agree that a plan is better than no plan. So let, let's begin that process because that's why we sw slid behind like that. We have time for one last question from a midshipman over here. Uh, good afternoon, sir. I'm Midshipman Third Class Walker from 23rd Company. Um, you spoke earlier about how China and Russia cannot work together because of the fundamental differences of their ambition, but also about how we are in some ways successfully countering their goals. As we, if we continue to do so in the future, would not our success push them closer together to work together as their fundamental want of their own survival and protection of what they have influences them to reduce their ambitions? I think that there's an other problem. Let's assume that Russia needed help in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. One, how do the Chinese get those forces there to help them in any meaningful period of time? Two, how do they supply them? Do the Russians have the ability to supply them? I doubt it very much. Three, how much do the Ch Russians want to see 200,000 Chinese wandering around Western Russia? Mm -hmm. So in the other case, the basic problem being confronted by the Chinese ought to be a land problem, but it is a naval problem. It is a naval problem against the strongest navy in the world. This is a very bad thing to do. I have some limited experience with the Russian navy. And after I finish laughing, I, you know, they are not going to come to the Chinese aid. The problem is they can't help each other. It's not a question of wanting to or feeling to or touchy-feely. It's they've got completely different strategic problems that don't kind of add up to something. Thank you, sir. Well, our time is up, unfortunately. Dr. Friedman, thank you so much for your time and for your insights. Uh, this has been a great conversation, a great discussion, and, and great Q&A. Um, we want to uh, uh, show our appreciation by presenting you a uh, book from the Naval Institute Press, From Berkeley to Berlin, How the Rad Lab Helped Avert Nuclear War by Tom Ramos. Uh, and for all today's attendance, uh, both virtual and in person, you'll receive an offer for a discounted subscription to Geopolitical Futures website, Dr. F Friedman's website. And with that subscription, you'll also receive access to the Road to 2040 study, where you'll get a glimpse into the future and learn what the world will look like almost two decades from today. Watch your email post event after this event for this special offer. Uh, please, let's give George one last round of applause. Thank you.